on this topic afterwards, which I'm looking forward to. So, well, everything seems to be set, so why not get started? Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's complex system seminar. Uh, my name is Carl, and this is Henrik and Victor. We're here to um, talk a bit today about the deep learning projects carried out on Google. Uh, so a quick outline of the presentation. We will do a uh, introduction. We will look at how a actually implemented system works. Some cool applications. A short look on future work, and finally a uh, summary. But we'll start by uh, making a definition. What is deep learning? And uh, first of all, we should differentiate between what's called machine learning and artificial intelligence, where um, artificial intelligence is, in most cases, considered to be where you're trying to create a machine that's smart from the start, which with today's technology is uh, very difficult. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, machine learning, which uh, is considered to be making a machine that can learn which is uh, very much possible with today's technology and what industry is mainly focusing on. And uh, even though the definition of deep learning is some, sometimes uh, a bit vague and uh, discussed, uh, it's in most cases considered to be a part of machine learning. But what makes uh, deep learning different? Uh, most cases you're looking at an artificial neural network with a large amount of layers. And the amount of layers is basically the depth of the network. And there comes the name deep learning. And as you can imagine, a uh, bigger, deeper network can learn more complex structures and patterns and so on. Uh, this is not really a new concept. This is basically a renaming or rebranding of something that was around in the 80s already called deep neural networks, uh, which at the time was more or less science fiction. You couldn't really implement it with the technology at the time. Uh, and there were several reasons for that. Today's different. Today we have the technology, and uh, let's have a look at why we can do it today. What do you need for deep learning? Uh, of course, with a very big amount of variables, uh, layers, and so on, you get a lot of parameters that are to be tweaked. And basically, you need a lot of data in order to train a network like this. Uh, and on the other hand, to carry out this training within a reasonable amount of time, you will need a lot of processing power. And both of these points were, of course, problems in the 80s, but uh, not today. Today we have the, the opportunities already there. So this brings us to uh, our focus of the day, which is Google. So why look at Google? Uh, they have, as you know, access to uh, huge amounts of data through the different services and applications they're providing. Uh, data collection is, since wasn't that digitalized back in the 80s, and, uh, not as big. Uh, Google has this. Uh, they've also, throughout the years, purchased many deep learning focusing companies. And by doing that, acquired a lot of the knowledge in this field and are now at the forefront. They also have access to uh, very powerful computers and many of them, which of course is key when you're trying to carry out these, these big training projects. And uh, on top of all this, they also have a strong incentive to be invested in deep learning, since they can use the results in their own applications. Uh, yeah. So uh, now you know a bit why we're looking at Google. So uh, let's have a look at what they've actually been, uh, been implementing. I'll hand it over to Rick. OK, so we'll talk about how the system works. They have developed. And it's a very complex system with many different parts. So in order to try to explain this, I will do it with the application, namely image recognition. So in normal cases, you have something like this, that you have a picture consisting of some pixels. And they look at a group of pixels at a time and enhance them and look for some basic features. Then you enhance it again and again until you have a clear feature. Okay, but how do you use this in a neural network? Well, uh, you've all probably read the neural networks course, so I won't go in depth on how weights and nodes and how that works. Uh, so we just throw this up. And this could be an example of a deep neural network where we have the input nodes on the left. 
So you put in the image here, and these nodes, the first nodes, they learn to recognize very simple features, like, for example, this one has learned a uh, line, but it can be any type of feature, so perhaps a uh, straight line, or a uh, colored dot, so very, very easy, very simple features, okay? And every node learns one of these, and then in the next layers, they are combined to create more advanced features. So, for example, uh, this neuron has to learn to recognize a human face. And uh, it's, this is a theory that we also have these neurons. And they are called grandmother neurons. That we learn to recognize some faces very good, like family members or family pets, such like that. So, for example, if you're in public and you see your a family member, you are easy to see a spot right away. And that's because we have one neuron that is trained to recognize that person. Okay? So, the further up we get in the, in the layers, the more advanced features we get. And uh, this is all unsupervised learning, so it has learned to do this by its own. So, as Carl said before, Google has a large amount of data. They, they bought YouTube a time ago. So, you also see there's a cat here, and uh, you might wonder why that is, and uh, it's because of the data set. So, it is taken from YouTube. So they have collected uh, one frame from 10 million separate YouTube videos, uh, and that is their training set. So, here you can see some, some examples of those, and the cat it's because there's very many cat videos on YouTube. So uh, that's why it exists. And uh, the size of the data is 200 by 200 pixels in color. So, and it's 10 million frames. So this is a huge amount of data. So in comparison, some G3 in the internet, of course, we had 1,000 uh, or 2,000 numbers we were fit. So we can maybe comprehend how big the compute power is needed to handle this. Uh, so how have they handled this? They have created a structure that's called disbelief. Uh, so I will show you the example of words. So if you have oops, spoiler. <laughs> so if you have a desired neural network that looks like this. So in order to make the computation in reasonable time, you split up the networks into parts. So uh, you have one computer that uh, optimizes the weights and parameters for every part of the network. So this example, the uh, blue here has one computer and that computer might have a number of cores. So the computation will be done in, in parallel. So you feed the training data into this system of computers, okay? But this is not enough. You need a lot more uh, computational power. So what it done was to create replicas of the network we've seen before and split up the training data into many different sets and feeding one part of it to every replica, okay? But experts, as you are in your networks, you may be wondering, how do you do with weights if you, if you calculate them in parallel? Well, they have central parameter servers for this. So every replica calculates some uh, difference in weights, sends it to the server, and gets the newest weights. And this is not really correct. It gets some errors, but due to the gain in computational power, it still works. Okay? So now, when we know how they do it, we may quite want to wonder how, how we use it in future work or using apps or stuff like that. Thank you. As Carl mentioned earlier, uh, the reason why we choose to focus at Google is because they have a lot of uh, applications where they can actually implement this kind of research. And, uh, 
I'm going to show you three examples. The first example is uh, visualization of uh, neural networks. And it might be useful for, for people that work with or trying to understand a neural network. Uh, it's not always easy to actually, if you have a working neural network, it might be difficult to understand why it works. But this is a way where you can try to understand what's going on inside the network. So what they've done is they start with a, a random picture, just uh, noise, and then they tweak it a little bit using statistics uh, from a uh, real picture, like two uh, neighboring pixels have uh, kind of the same color, for example. And then you tweak it until the network classifies it as something. In this case, it was trained to recognize bananas. And according to the network, this is a banana that is here. So that's the kind of the image that the network has of a banana. You can clearly see like some banana features in there, but you might not have yeah, said that it's a banana to say. And it's, so it's interesting that the network have a different idea of what we, how we classify things. This is, for example, how a network can classify dumbbells. Uh, I mean, some shapes here are, look like actual dumbbells, but one interesting thing is that there seems to be an arm connected almost to the dumbbells. That's probably because the data set that they used to train the network had our person uh, carrying the dumbbell or using the dumbbell. So that's how the network uh, uh, see, it, see it. And this might be useful if you have a network that doesn't work. It can be useful with this, for example. If it doesn't classify things or, uh, correctly, then it might be that the arm, for example, could be an issue. Uh, so as, as uh, Victor told earlier, different layers have different tasks. And the first layer is handling more uh, uh, are sensitive to things like uh, edges and orientation, whereas the higher levels have more sophisticated features, and even whole uh, objects can emerge. So another technique to visualize is that you give the network a picture of something, and then whatever the network sees in a specific layer, you ask to enhance whatever it sees. And by doing this on a network with 30, 40 layers and using the uh, higher la layers and ask the network to clarify what it see or enhance what it see, like we did when we were kids looking at clouds, we could see different animals in the clouds. And this is a network trained on animals. And as you can see, <laughs> there some, it's, a, it's not that clear from this picture, uh, but there are animals showing up. It will seem to be like a bird here. And these are uh, some examples of uh, animals that it saw in the cloud. So don't worry, no animals were harmed during this presentation. This is the network that is responsible for creating this. this not, it wasn't trained on mutated animals. So it's pretty interesting how the network see things, like different from how we see things. Uh, and uh, if you use the same algorithm, uh, ask to, uh, the network to enhance whatever it is, and you do this in an uh, iteration, and for each iteration you zoom in a little on a picture. Even with a random uh, picture like we had in the beginning, some pretty interesting things can occur if you have trained the network on many different things. And here's um, some examples of that, which is, was a random picture, and then uh, the network actually created this. Or the information is stored within the network from the uh, trading, but this is pretty interesting things. Maybe art, I don't know. Uh, that's the visualization. Uh, there's uh, something called Google Dream Generator that uses this. And you can, there's a link in the end of the slides if you're interested to create your own pictures. Uh, now we'll talk a little about uh, uh, Google Translate. It's an application. Uh, you can be used on cell phones, for example, and it does real-time visual translation uh, in over 20 languages. So what it does is it uses machine learning to uh, recognize uh, letters, and then when it knows about the letters, it uses the letters to do a word lookup in a dictionary. It uses the approximate uh, dictionary lookup, which means that it's, it knows that or it's aware that some of the letters might be incorrect. And then when it has the translated word, it really knows the pixels, that's uh, the letter, and it, uh, it uh, replaces the reading word with the translated one. So actually, you can, when you use your camera, it, it takes away the reading word and replaces it with the translated one. It works pretty decent. 
So how do they do this? Well, first of all, you don't want to train your network on something that's just perfect letters because then you will obviously have trouble uh, classifying things correctly when you have real uh, images that contain like dirt and skewness or uh, reflections. And it's really difficult to get a good data set uh, for 20 different languages in that many letters. So what they did instead was they uh, used computer and generated letters with some dirt or reflection simulated in it. And by doing this, success, they need to be able to run this on slow devices like mobile phones, for example, and many of those devices have bad connections, so you can't do, like, uh, do the actual computation in a cloud, for example, and then send it back to the user, but it needs to be done on the cell phone. So what they've done is that they, uh, they train the network as little as possible, so they train as little as possible, and as soon as something goes wrong, for example, that a dollar sign or an S were uh, mixed up, they train a little bit more on those features. So they had like an ultimate train network. And by using uh, parallelization in the cell phone, for example, they can actually do this in real time, which is pretty interesting. Um, the third application is the thumbnail generator on YouTube videos. But they have a problem with, for example, negative examples like here. That's not something you probably may click on, and they want videos to be watched. So uh, you can already choose a thumbnail manually, uh, and that way you get like a, a good interface to the audience. But many people are too lazy to do that because they know, or so they want it to be done automatically. So they create an algorithm for this, and they take the uploaded video, and they take samples like every second, and then they use a neural network to give the each uh, uh, potential thumbnail score, and then they do uh, enhancement and rendering for each uh, uh, resolution. So what they did was that they they, they took a lot of uh, uh, thumbnails from already popular YouTube videos where people have chose their own thumbnail, and they they train network this so you can kind of recognize what a good thumbnail is and then score based on that. And by doing so, they actually get pretty good results. And it's being used in YouTube as of now. So expect to see better thumbnails out there. Um, that was the applications. And now I hand it over to Carl again to kind of talk a little bit about the future and some. Okay, so uh, as promised, uh, we will look at some new or future work within deep learning where um, we would like to mention a platform called TensorFlow, which is uh, Google's new machine learning platform that was launched just recently, a couple of weeks ago on uh, November 9th. Uh, however, this was the commercial launch, so it's probable that Google has been using it even before that, maybe even in some of the applications you see today. Uh, but this platform is supposed to uh, replace Disbelief uh, that was launched back in 2011. Uh, and of course, there has been some improvements. They look at uh, stability and speed and so on to make it better in uh, different ways that they found uh, they found flaws in Disbelief. But also, uh, it's generalized. Uh, you don't have to necessarily look at uh, artificial neural networks, but you can use other structures or other features. Uh, it's a bit more universal than disbelief, which is, a, uh, of course, a big difference. It's been benchmarked to, uh, in some aspects, to be to up to twice as fast, which, of course, is uh, important in, in these kinds of projects. Uh, and a really cool feature on top of all that is the fact that it's open source. Uh, anyone can get it, look at it, and use it as they want. Uh, it's even licensed so that other companies can use it and so on. And, by doing that, they, uh, there is a uh, possibility for a big community where developers get in and uh, try to uh, figure out what this could be used for. I think already there is some um, example code that you can have a look at. It, and, uh, it might be a bit weird to call this future work we, uh, because it's not really, we don't know what it, what it will do, but we uh, personally think that there's a lot of potential to this and we uh, would tip you to uh, have a look at it yourself. And we'll leave the link later on in the presentation. So that's a short look at some future work. Uh, so then we would like to uh, sum up this presentation. 
So what has happened so far? Uh, we're talking ideas that were uh, existed already back in the 80s, but there wasn't the technology to implement them. But as uh, technology has caught up, uh, this field has more or less exploded. And that by involving bigger companies like Google and others, uh, we've uh, the result is basically that you now have a lot of applications that you use every day that actually uses deep learning, which is quite amazing since it's, it's really so that it's so advanced and also so young as a field. Um, and now, as I just uh, showed you, there's an open source platform I'm inviting anyone to have a look at what they what Google has been doing and to try it out yourself and who knows what that will uh, result in. And um, standing in front of a class of students from the Complex Adaptive Systems program, I would say it's probable that maybe some of you will be involved in taking the next big step within this field and probably within the next few years. So we, will, we look forward to seeing where, uh, where, where it will all land in the future. So now we would like to ask you, are there any uh, questions on our presentation? And if not, we would like to thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you.